This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Good evening. I apologize for keeping you waiting, but I bet I don't have to tell you what the problem was. <laughs> it's absolutely gridlocked out there. My name is Marsha Landl. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Washington, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. We're here tonight because of a very generous gift that was given to the University of Washington. This visiting professorship uh, program was created in 1961 with a bequest from the estate of Mr. John Dance. Mr. Dance came to Seattle in the early days of this century and became a very successful businessman. He is perhaps best known to people in this region for the chain of movie theaters that he developed in this and other states. John Dance was a self-educated man who read widely and liberally. He was fascinated by scientific developments and was particularly interested in the philosophy of humanism. In creating this endowment, his goal was to bring distinguished lecturers and scholars of international reputation to the University of Washington. Particularly, he wanted us to bring those men and women who, and I'm quoting from the bequest, those men and women who have concerned themselves with man's impact, or, or with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Mr. Dance's wife, Jessie, shared this vision and augmented the endowment with additional gifts until the time of her death. I think you will agree with me that theirs was indeed a far-sighted and invaluable gift, both to this university and to the citizens of this region. Before proceeding with the program tonight, I'd like to recognize a few individuals who make this possible. There is a faculty selection committee that reviews uh, many, many nominees every year to choose those people that we will invite here as dance lecturers and Walker Ames lecturers. I won't name all of the members of the committee, but I would like to particularly thank the co-chairs who are here this evening, Michael Halloran, who is a divisional dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, and Gerald Baldesty, a professor of communications. <laughs> More importantly, I want to thank Janet Jones, who is the person in the graduate school who is the coordinator for these lectureships and who does all the behind the scenes work to make sure that the room is reserved and the cameras are all working. Uh, it's a terrific job and uh, I thank Janet for all of the good work that she does uh, for all of these lectures. <laughs> Our speaker tonight, Dr. Daniel Dennett, will be introduced by a distinguished member of our faculty. Professor Kelly Hughes received his PhD from the University of Utah in 1984. He conducted postdoctoral research at the University of Texas and at Caltech, and then joined the faculty of the University of Washington in 1989 uh, as a member of the Department of Microbiology. His teaching and research focus on the genetic analysis of complex biological processes, and he's particularly interested in gene regulation that is mediated through DNA structural alterations. Dr. Hughes. Thank you. So it's a tremendous honor for me to introduce Dan Dennett for the uh, Jesse and John Dan's lecture tonight. And I really want to thank the Dan's family for making this possible. Um, as you heard from, from Dean Landel, the purpose of the Jesse and John Dan's lecture series is to bring to the Seattle public someone whose work has a broad impact on society and thinking. 
Indeed, Professor Dennett's nominations came from many faculty outside his field of philosophy. Professor Daniel Dennett received his undergraduate degree from Harvard University. He received his Doctor of Philosophy in Philosophy at Oxford University. He accepted a position at the University of California, Irvine, and one year after promotion to associate professor, he moved to Tufts University in Boston. One year after promotion to full professor, he became chairman of the philosophy department there. In 1985, he received the title of Distinguished Professor of Arts and Sciences and was appointed the director of the Center for Cognitive Studies at Tufts. He serves as associate editor for Behavioral and Brain Science and Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. He serves on the editorial board, editorial board of 11 other journals. He's published numerous articles and has given numerous invited seminars. Other honors include 30 fellowship and special lecture awards, in two, including two Guggenheim Fellowships, Fulbright Fellowship, the 1992 Darwin Lecture in Cambridge, and has served as president of the Society for Philosophy and Psychology. He's published nine books on consciousness, the brain, consciousness, the brain and evolution. And one of these books, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, was of particular significance and led many faculty members to nominate him for the Jesse and John Dance Lecture. Throughout my career in genetics, I thought I understood Darwin and evolution, that is, until I read Professor Dennett's book. As he guided me through design space and the library of Mendel, I could truly appreciate the awesome power of Darwin's dangerous idea, the difference between what is possible and what is actual. Professor Dennett was courageous enough to go beyond the normal controversies of Darwinian evolution to, s to discuss its philosophical implications for society and morality. Furthermore, he provided much needed criticism to the field. Professor Dennett is here to enlighten us on what such a revolutionary idea that Darwin proposed, revolutionary for both the past and future history of mankind. It's time to get rid of the skyhooks and start to focus on the cranes. The title of Dr. Dennett's talk is, Is Evolution an Algorithmic Process? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Dennett. Well, I'm very honored and delighted to be here, to be back in Seattle again, and to give the dance lecture. It's a very distinguished series, and I'm uh, thrilled to be here. I'm also particularly thrilled to be the guest of the biology department. Uh, as a philosopher, I have learned that not many scientists uh, hold philosophy in high esteem. In fact, another biologist recently said as much. For most wearers of white coats, philosophy is to science as pornography is to sex. <laughs> it's cheaper, easier, and some people seem bafflingly <laughs> to prefer it. Well, here I am, and I'm delighted that the people in white coats here want to want to have a, a philosopher speak. And I think that we're changing that attitude towards philosophy and philosophers uh, by leaps and bounds in the areas that I'm working in, in uh, sort of cognitive science and in evolutionary theory, precisely because the really interesting problems in those areas are conceptual problems. They're not, we're drowning in data. The problems are not gathering data. The problems are coming up with theories. And the obstacle to theory is very often just not figuring out what the right question is to ask. And that's what we philosophers pride ourselves in being good at, is coming up with better questions. Now, <coughs> some of you may have been here a few years ago, I think in this very building, when I gave a talk about Darwin's dangerous idea. And you'll notice that my first two overheads are the same. Don't worry, it's not the same talk. <laughs> it's, it just starts the same, and then, it, and then it moves on from there. This is Darwin's dangerous idea. That's it, the whole thing. And I want to just walk through it with you. I want to draw out a few factors about it. I've, I've sort of set it up a little bit so you can see that it is a logical argument. I've bolded the ifs. So let's just walk through and see how it goes. If, during the long course of ages and under varying conditions of life, organic beings vary at all in the several parts of their organization, 
and I think this cannot be disputed, that's the empirical part. If there be, owing to the high geometric powers of increase of each species at some age, season, or year, a severe struggle for life, and this certainly cannot be disputed, then, considering the infinite complexity of the relations of all organic beings to each other and to their conditions of existence, causing an infinite diversity in structure, constitution, and habits to be advantageous to them, I think it would be a most extraordinary fact if no variation ever had occurred useful to each being's own welfare, in the same way as so many variations have occurred useful to man. But if variations useful to any organic being do occur, assuredly individuals thus characterized will have the best chance of being preserved in the struggle for life, and from the strong principle of inheritance, they will tend to produce offspring similarly characterized. This principle of preservation I have called, for the sake of brevity, natural selection. That's it. That is Darwin's dangerous idea. And you'll note that it is in the form of an argument and that it presents itself as almost a, a, a necessary truth. And in fact, over the years, there's been a great deal of work by philosophers and theorists of, of evolution trying to make out that there was something wrong about the fact that this seemed to be like a tautology. There was something wrong with this feature. And I want to suggest, uh, echoing people down the road in Redmond, it isn't a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> what, what Darwin didn't have the language to put it this way, but what we've got here is a description of an algorithm. And I claimed in Darwin's dangerous idea that evolution is an algorithmic process, that this is what Darwin discovered. And this is what I want to defend and explain today. And it's a very unsettling thought for many people. My favorite reaction to Darwin's idea came in a review in the Athenaeum, which was sort of the New York Review of Books of its day, by, it was published anonymously, but we've since found out it was a man named Robert Beverly McKenzie who had this, this wonderful thing to say. By the way, these caps were in the original. In the theory with which we have to deal, absolute ignorance is the artificer, so that we may enunciate as the fundamental principle of the whole system that in order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. This proposition will be found, on careful examination, to express in condensed form the essential purport of the theory, and to express in a few words all Mr. Darwin's meaning, who, by a strange inversion of reasoning, seems to think absolute ignorance fully qualified to take the place of absolute wisdom in all the achievements of creative skill. He's got it. That's it. That is, he's Perfect. That's the idea. He's got it. <laughs> and the reason this is such a strange inversion of reasoning is that it turns upside down an idea which I think may actually be older than the species, our species. Homo habilis, the handyman, may have had some glimmering of a hunch that it takes a big fancy thing to make a lesser thing, like a arrowhead. You never see a pot making a potter. You never see a horseshoe making a blacksmith. It's always the other way around. And I think this idea is sort of deeply ingrained in our sense of how things come to be. This is the top-down theory of creation. And as Mackenzie, so in his outrage, expressed so perfectly, Darwin says, no, we're going to turn that right upside down. We're going to see mind as an, uh, as an effect, not a cause. We're going to start with absolute ignorance, not absolute wisdom. Well, now the idea that you could make something in a process which didn't have any mind is an idea, really, that you could make something with a purely mechanical, mindless process, if it was the right sort of process. It would have to be an algorithmic process. And curiously enough, this strange and to some people, scary and offensive idea, has often been noted by humanists, by poets. For instance, here's the great French poet Paul Valéry. 
It takes two to invent anything. The one makes up combinations, the other one chooses. Recognizes what he wishes and what is important to him in the mass of the things which the former has imparted to him. What we call genius is much less the work of the first one than the readiness of the second one to grasp the value of what has been laid before him and to choose it. What Valerie is describing there, and he is suggesting that it is a universal truth, a truth of poetry, is it takes a generate and test algorithm to create anything. So here then is the, is the claim that I am making on behalf of Darwin, Darwinism, it's that life on Earth has been generated over billions of years in a single branching tree, the tree of life, by one algorithmic process or another. And these algorithms are generate and test algorithms, which is a subspecies of sorting algorithms. Now, some people I know don't know what an algorithm is. This is a new word to them. So I'm going to I'm going to describe what an algorithm is, and I'm going to use a very homely example, long division. Now, algorithms are procedures, they're processes. Mathematical processes are very good examples, but there's others I'll mention. Long division is one that we all know. And it has, like all algorithms, three features, substrate neutrality, underlying mindlessness, and guaranteed results. And I want to explain each one of these in turn. The substrate neutrality is very simple. If you're doing long division, it doesn't matter whether you use chalk, pencil, pen, crayon, whether you scratch it with a stick in the sand, or skywrite it in the air, or just do it in your head. The power of the algorithm has nothing to do with the medium in which it's realized. That's the first point, substrate neutrality. The second point, underlying mindlessness, is a little less obvious, especially in the case of long division, but let's think about it. I remember when I first learned long division, I ran into this problem that we see here. 47, Gazinta 326, how many times? Oh, help. Ah, what do I do? And the teacher said, guess. Guess? This is arithmetic. This is mathematics. You're not supposed to guess. No, no, just guess. And if you don't guess right, you can correct it. Ah, you mean just randomly guess, if need be, randomly. You can guess at random. Try it. If it's too low, increment it by one. Try again. If it's too low, increment it by one. Try again. You don't have to guess. You can even be maximally stupid at guessing. And if you just keep turning the crank, you'll get the answer right. It'll just take a little longer. So even a simple algorithm like long division has some very nice properties from my point of view because, one, it lets you use randomness. You can, make, you can guess at random. Lots of algorithms make use of randomness. And then it just sort of swallows the randomness up because it's, it's just a temporary thing. You guess and then turn the crank and guess and turn the crank and guess and turn the crank. But it also permits you to do it a little faster. You can speed up if you have a little extra knowledge. If you can, if you can direct your guesses a little bit, then the thing goes a little faster. But it's not necessary. It's just a speed up to the underlying algorithmic process. It's this third feature, guaranteed results, that gives everybody uh, fits and that has gotten me, in effect, in trouble. There's been a lot of misunderstanding about this. And so I'm going to take a little time to explain what this means. Now, I thought I'd done this in my book, but I guess I didn't succeed. Because Stephen Gould, in a recent article in today's New York Review of Books, that is this current a uh, few years ago, last year, had the following thing to say, three, three quotes about my idea that d evolution is an algorithmic process. If evolution were powered by a single force producing one kind of result, then an explanatory simplicity might descend upon evolution's overt richness. Evolution then might become algorithmic, a surefire logical procedure, as in Daniel Dennett's reverie. But, and here we encounter Dennett's disabling error once again, 
evolution includes so much more than natural selection that it cannot be algorithmic in Dennett's simple calculational sense. Crank your algorithm of natural selection to your heart's content, and you cannot grind out the contingent patterns built during the Earth's geological history. For some reason, Gould and others seem to think that the contingency, the amplification of contingency, shows that evolution is not an algorithmic process. Now, the funny thing about this is that I thought I'd countered that ab initio when I first talked about algorithms, because I gave the example of a sorting algorithm, a tennis tournament. So now here we have a tennis tournament. George Smith's a colleague of mine. So uh, you, you, Boris Becker beats Dan Dennett, Pete Sampras beats George Smith, and then you write the winner's name in here. We all know this is an algorithm. Notice it's not arithmetic. This is a sorting algorithm. It's much more like the sorting algorithms of evolution. Now. I also considered in the book a weirder elimination tournament, same structure as a coin tossing tournament. It produces a winner every time, different winner, but it always produces a winner. But of course, you can't, you can't judge anything from who that winner is. If you win a coin tossing tournament, you don't, hey, you won, but that's it. <laughs> don't think you ought to play again for big stakes. Anybody gives you that idea, walk away quick. But now I also said, look, this is an algorithm. This is a, this is a, uh, a tennis tournament algorithm is an algorithm. But let's suppose a variation. I want to introduce some massive contingency here. So here's what we're going to do. The end of each match, the winner of the match picks up a six shooter with one bullet, spins the chamber, puts the gun to his temple, and pulls the trigger. Well, one out of six times on average, the guy who just lost the match now wins by default and goes into the next round. <laughs> now, that's pretty massive contingency. This is a catastrophe. This is like a, uh, well, like a mass extinction. And notice it's still going to produce a winner. Now, under those circumstances, I'm going to win that tournament about two or three times out of 100. You run the tape of life 100 times, I'm going to win that tournament two or three times, uh, even with this huge, massive contingency, most of the time, either Boris or Sampras wins the tournament. They're still algorithms, even though we introduce huge influxes of catastrophe, of mass extinction. Consider your word processor. That's an algorithm. Does it always do the same thing? In one sense, yes. In one sense, no. The input is different, so it does different things. But it always does the same different things with those inputs. That's what makes it an algorithm. Now, or consider, I just want to drive home how obvious it is that algorithms can be not just random, but unpredictable. Screensavers, for instance. How about that screensaver that, that draws the colored pipes all over your screen? Never twice the same way. Is it an algorithm? Of course it is. Do you ever get, if you rewind the tape of life again and again, do you get the same thing? No. Does that show it's not an algorithm? No, not at all. There is, in fact, if you want to see an interesting, creative, random algorithm, you might want to check out this website. Some of you may already know this. It generates at random for you, as soon as you push the button, a postmodernist essay, complete with footnotes, <laughs> jargon, and lots of quotations from Derrida and others like that all ready to hand in to your <laughs> professor. <laughs> or, as Richard Dawkins has suggested, mail it in four copies to the editor of Social Texts <laughs> magazine, and you might get it published. It's an algorithm that produces a different, quite remarkable object every time. Now, 
So as I say, there's no conflict, in fact, between massive contingency and algorithmicity. So on one ground, you might just say, well, people who, who've made this, they're just confused, they're just wrong, that's, that's, that's just a simple confusion. But you know, I got to thinking about it, and I realized that, yes, it's a confusion, but usually smart people don't get that confused unless there's something interesting lying behind it. There must be some deeper, more interesting point that people are trying to get at, and I think I've found it, and that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. And I'm going to do this by starting with some manifestly algorithmic evolutionary algorithms, and then walking us through a progression of ever more complex algorithm, evolutionary algorithms that repair the short, uh, shortcomings of the earlier ones. And I'm going to start with one that uh, you may be familiar with. It's the blind watchmaker algorithm that Richard Dawkins put in his book, uh, The Blind Watchmaker. And I thought about bringing, getting an old Mac. I only have an old version, setting it up and running it so you could see how it works. On the screen, there's, an, there's a critter. It might look like a tree or it might look like a bug. In the middle of the screen, it's, the screen is divided like a tic-tac-toe screen into, into, into nine squares. And surrounding the central figure are eight mutants, different at one locus by one item from the one in the middle. If you like one of those better than the one in the middle, you just, you just mouse it. And it moves to the center and generates a new generation. So this is a repetitive generations. And so it looks like this. You start here, and in a few generations, you've, you've got to this creature here from the original. Now, this is a very clearly an algorithm. And it's also, of course, one where you're doing the selecting. You just simply decide on aesthetic grounds or whatever grounds you like what kind of things you can make. And you can make from the same starting point all sorts of, an, of amazing uh, uh, devices, biomorphs, as he calls them. Uh, this just shows a few of the phenotypes that are generatable by this program. Now, that is a fascinating exercise in the underlying evolutionary algorithm. It, ha it exhibits some properties that are very interesting from an evolutionary point of view. For instance, it's almost impossible to go backwards, to undo the work you've done. The space is so huge that trying to, w to work your way back through the choice points to get back to where you were is, is, is very hard, which of course has its parallel in, in evolution. But now I want to show you a video of the uh, a next step, and in fact, this is a step that was inspired to some degree by Dawkins' blind watchmaker. And this is work that was done at thinking machines. Uh, Danny Hillis, when he started thinking machines to make the famous parallel connection machine, he wanted to have some really dramatic demonstrations of the power of this computer. And he hired a brilliant young computer graphics person named Carl Sims to, to do some computer graphics. And Carl came up with some evolved virtual creatures. And I'm now going to show you a little video and th at the first part of it, you may have already seen because it, Alan Alda is describing this as it was in the Scientific American program. And then after he's through talking, I'm going to let the tape run a little further because I've got some of Carl's own video, which goes beyond what you see. But Alda does such a beautiful job of explaining the system that I'm, gonna, I'm just going to turn it over to Alan Alda for a couple of minutes now. So if we can run the uh, video now. But these creatures are the result of an astounding new idea that may soon take us from the dog level to super intelligence. Robots like Flaky must be programmed feature by feature, but not these strange things. They created themselves through a process called artificial evolution. Evolution by itself has led to the creation of incredible complexity. Our cells, all of the organisms in the world, this process happened on its own, at least in my opinion. There is nobody that assembled all of these wonderful things in the world. On computers, we can simulate the same process, and we can get these very complicated, very interesting things without having to understand them and assemble them. When he first dreamed up this evolution idea, Carl Sims couldn't predict what would happen. He just gave his computer some basic parts and let his creatures go from there. 
The bodies of these creatures are fairly simple. They're just made of some number of blocks. The blocks are connected by joints, which can bend or twist. The creatures also have a nervous system. They have sensors, which can sense the angle of the joints or sense contact. And the nervous system processes the signals from the sensors and tells the muscles when to move, which generates some kind of behavior. I've given it the capability to include all of these elements, but the computer actually decides how they're assembled and how they're used in specific creatures. Numbers chosen randomly by the computer, a synthetic genetic code, described how the first simple creature would look and how its nervous system would be wired. Then it was put into a simulated lake and told to swim. It twitched, but it didn't get anywhere. So now the computer went to work. Using the original numbers as its base, the computer made a few random changes, the equivalent of mutations. It did this again and again, creating a new generation of 300 different offspring. Then all the offspring got a swimming test, with the best swimmers selected as the basis for the next generation. When the computer makes mutations in the genes of these creatures, it has no idea what these mutations are going to do. Sometimes the mutations might knock out a piece of the nervous system and perhaps cause the muscles not, not to move anymore. But other mutations might actually improve the motion. So from the original creature, increasingly better swimmers evolved over generations, all without any human intervention. This was the best swimmer of all. But when Carl Sims put it on simulated land, it was like a fish out of water. So over subsequent generations, the mutation and selection process had a new goal, to walk. After 15 generations, this was the champion. Other computer runs have produced even better walkers. Sometimes these evolving creatures would think of solutions to their goal, which were completely different than I expected. In this one example, the creatures got taller and taller and taller and would simply fall over instead of figuring out some clever way of walking, they would fall to generate horizontal velocity. What I was telling them to do was to just move, and falling was a perfectly good solution as far as they're concerned. So this creature specialized in falling for as long as it possibly could, including doing a complete somersault. The strength of artificial evolution is that it comes up with solutions that computer programmers could never imagine. That's the end of the Alan Alda bit, and I'm going to narrate a bit more, because these are Carl's own uh, uh, bits, and I'm going to let it run a bit, because I want to show some of the things he then did after he, uh, uh, after he did these first few experiments. By the way, if you look at the developmental program that takes the genome to the phenotype, you'll see that there's no enforcement of symmetry, so that if you see symmetry, and you see it again and again, it's evolved, this is convergent evolution, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a developmental constraint. And you also, of course, see, see organisms that don't have symmetry, that have these weird asymmetrical excrescences that have not been selected against yet. Um, now let's see, I don't know whether I should ask you, to, okay, good, we're going to get some walking. Now, when, when Carl first did the simulated physics, there were a number of little bugs in it, because of course you have to simulate the physical laws, and you saw the one problem, which was the falling thing. He, it was just measuring distance from the origin was, was how he was measuring uh, uh, forward motion. But he also had the physics a little bit wrong. There was one creature that moved like this, you know. <laughs> 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 have to, 
You have to go back in and tweak the physics and get it right. Cause you need <laughs> but there is one that does make very interesting use of, uh, of uh, I mean, you see things like this, you realize nobody could dream up something like this. this is, I mean, you see there's this wonderful sort of elephant thing with a trunk where it grows this great long trunk to change the coefficient of friction of a little extra, uh, a little extra foot it's got at the bottom. Let's see where it is. Here it is. You see, it's, it's having that weight cantilevered out over the side that lets that little block actually pull it a little bit. So these are a few of the, of the walkers. But I have to let this run a bit more because I want to show you uh, uh, some further innovations that will be important to what I'm going to say later. Uh, that's fun to look at anyway, what the heck. If ever a picture was worth a thousand words. Okay, let's see. Come on, Carl. Where are we going to get the... Oh, we have to go through jumping, and then we're going to get following. Now, all he does, does it, all he does is he simply changes the selection rule. Now it's simply getting off the plane. That's what select. Oh, now here we go. Following. I wanted to show you this. So now you see. They're doing photo photo taxis. In effect, it's uh, following the, following the, finding the red light, going to the red light. <laughs> I always get the feeling of water going up my nose at this point. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the videotape. Now, we will, we will, we will stop it there. Uh, there's more, there's much more, but, but I have to get on with my part of the talk. Now, I think that Carl's work is wonderful, and one of the reasons I love to show it is that even as a, you know, as a card-carrying fundamentalist Darwinian, I'm amazed at how swiftly and efficiently those, those very plausibly biological life forms emerge. It's, it's stunning how effective that process is. If I'd been asked to bet ahead of time whether he'd get such results that fast, I would probably have bet against him. It, however, it has some striking limits, and I want to talk about those limits. Um, for instance, you saw that, that phototropism right there at the end, the following. Well, how did that evolve? And the answer is it didn't. He had to reach in and add a capacity for photosensors. As he says in the paper on this, he says, photosensors were enabled. <laughs> Life was breathed into photosensors were enabled. Because what he had to do is, this is a diagram, he has to add a new circle type. He has to add a new, he has to add a new part of the genome. He has to lengthen the genome. And the reason that that can't evolve is very simple. The genome and the developmental program are outside the model. They're not visible to selection. There's no costs and no benefits associated with them. They're simply backstage doing the work. So that that couldn't evolve. That's simply a closed part of the system. Now, you might think, well, that just shows why evolution is an algorithmic process. But of course, there's no reason why a, an evolutionary algorithm has to do that. And in fact, John Holland, uh, in his ecosystem fills exactly that gap. In, in the ecosystem uh, uh, that Holland and his colleagues have built, it's again, it's a simulated world, it's a virtual world, and in this world there are sort of fountains of resources, A, B, and C, coming into this world, and there's agent interactions of various sorts. But the point that I really want to, to make is that for an agent 
to make a chromosome, it's got to have the raw materials to make the chromosome. It's, it's got to eat, it's got to use raw materials from the world to make the chromosome so that it is possible in principle to either uh, evolve a longer or a shorter genome in the course of, uh, here for instance, I'm just not going to bother explaining these diagrams from the book clearly, but here you have, you have resources that then are available to build various body parts, including, including your own uh, replicative parts, which you have to do before you can have offspring. Whereas, of course, in, in Sim's world, uh, there's no eating, there's no food, there's no resources, uh, so that offspring are simply determined by who wins the, the selection tournament. Now, the echo world has a significant improvement and is hence much more open-ended than the Sims world, but it's still, of course, a virtual world. It's not concrete. Now the question is, does that make any difference? Does the fact that real evolution occurs in the real world make a difference? If so, what? Well, I think it does make a difference of a sort I want to explain. In the real world, if you make a hotel, you have to go to a lot of trouble, money, expense, to insulate the rooms so that people can't hear each other in the neighboring rooms. In a virtual hotel, it's just the other way around. In a virtual hotel, you have to go to a lot of trouble so that they can overhear each other. You don't, you, they don't overhear each other for free. You have to add this as an extra feature. Virtual worlds only have what you put in them, and you have to add non-insulation at a considerable cost and expense uh, in order to get that effect. If you've ever tried to write a video game program or something like that, you know what the general category is that we're talking about here. It's what's called collision detection. In the world of computer graphics or in virtual worlds, things will just go right through each other. They won't even see each other unless you build in collision detection. You don't get it as you do in the world for free. And collision detection is expensive. What I want to suggest is that the, anal the analog of collision detection is actually playing an important role in real evolution. Um, hello, I've got a page out of order here. No, I don't. I have a whole bunch of pages out of order. Excuse me for just a moment here. How did this happen? Well, I will just continue on without them. In, in Doug Hofstadter's recent book, Le Tombeau de Marot, he speaks of spontaneous intrusions into a creative process. He's talking about composing music and writing poetry. But I think the same is true of, as Valerie suggested, of all creative algorithms of all creative processes where it's very important that there be a lot of junk in the world, a lot of noise. In the real world, things, when they move, they make wakes, they leave shadows, they have aromas, they make noise. They generally scuff the world up as they go by. In a virtual world, it's very quiet. You don't have any of that unless you add it. And it's the collisions and interactions with all of the a-functional and non-functional stuff, the mere detritus and garbage and stuff, junk in the world, that is actually playing a large role in real evolution, playing the role of being the stuff that is then available as raw material, as objet trouvé, to be found and then exploited and used in the evolutionary process. Ah, I found my pages. My suggestion is that this modeling of evolution, to the extent that it doesn't include lots of collision detection, lots of junk, will always be seriously 
impoverished compared to the actual evolutionary algorithms that run in the concrete world. Think how important those have been. Here's a recent picture of the tree of life uh, from an article in Science of a year or two ago. And right here we see uh, the eukarya, the eukaryotic uh, lineages. And my goodness, how important those have been. There's the plants and the animals, all the big fancy stuff uh, comes out of this. And, and, and what happened here? What happened there was a collision of two lineages of prokaryotic cells that where one of them bumped into the other and became a, 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 an endosymbiont, a sort of parasite, and created a whole new sort of thing. In order to have an evolutionary algorithm that permits that kind of blindsiding coming from out of left field and, and adding into the process, you really have to add lots and lots of dimensions of, uh, of features, and we're moving in the direction, that is, of concreteness. It's still, however, an algorithm. Now, let me point out what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that what's wrong with, say, Carl Sims' virtual creatures is that they're made out of bits instead of being made out of proteins or carbon or anything like that. Being virtual is fine. It's just orders of magnitude simpler than real concrete things. And it's the simplicity, not the material, that makes the difference. And in defense of Sims' work, I would say what's fascinating, what really proves Darwin's point, is how in that shockingly simple world, orders and orders of magnitude simpler than concrete reality, we still get so much evolutionary power. I mean, you just saw it for yourself. You don't need many dimensions of complexity to produce results from the evolutionary algorithm. Uh, what I want to suggest is that the truth lurking behind the misbegotten idea that evolution is not an algorithmic process because of the fact of contingency is just that there is something which we might call an epistemological homeostasis. That is, a diminishing returns. As we try to make ever more realistic computer models of evolution, we're going to run into the problem that it becomes more and more expensive to add the dimensionality that would give you a really good, powerful, creative, open-ended evolutionary process. And after all, the very thing you'd be adding is the very thing, the absence of which makes computer modeling so wonderful, and that's the quietness of the model. It's the very quietness of computer models that makes them wonderful and tractable. And what I'm suggesting is if you start making them really, really, really noisy, you might as well stop doing computer modeling and just go to the concrete world. And that, too, is possible. And I want to end up by telling you about my favorite recent uh, uh, adventure in um, evolutionary algorithms. And this is Inman Harvey and Phil Husbands in their group at Sussex in evolutionary robotics. Now. Evolutionary robotics uses real robots, such as this little Keppra. Now, a Keppra is, is pretty small, it's about the size of a hockey puck. It's got some little wheels. You can put little light sensors, photo sensors on it. And what, what Harvey and his group wanted to do was to evolve the same thing that we saw virtual in, in, uh, in the case of Carl Sims, and that's phototropism, except something a little better than that. Wanted to evolve this hockey puck robot which if you put it in a very simple environment with a few eye spots, would seek out the white triangles and shun the white squares. That's it. That's all it has to do. Otherwise, it's going to have tests very similar in spirit to the, to the swimming tests and jumping tests in, in the Carl Sims. But this is going to be in the real world. So we're going to have evolutionary, we're going to have genomes that, that uh, specify particular phenotypes that are then going to be tested in the real world. Well, I can hear you thinking, oh my gosh, a lot of time with a soldering iron is going to be spent rewiring all those little babies. This is where H Harvey had a wonderful idea, what he calls the gantry robot. This is a situation beloved by philosophers, 
the brain in the vat. What he did was he made a gantry. This is this over, it's an overhead crane. So here's the gantry. This rolls this way. And then there's another little gantry here that rolls this way. And hanging down from the gantry is a stock, which is connected by, the, by an umbilical to a computer. Down on this stock right there, there's a little video camera. Underneath the video camera, there's a dental mirror, a 45-degree angle dental mirror, which is aimed out like that. And the video camera picks up whatever light is bounced off that. That is sent into the computer and divided up into pixels, only three of which are saved. Those are the three eye spots. So you can move eye spots around uh, by simply deciding which of the pixels from the television camera uh, are, are, are to be consulted. The rest of the information is just thrown away. So what happens is there's a genetic program, just as in Carl Sims, there's a genetic algorithm which creates new genomes, and then there's a developmental program that produces new um, nervous systems. This is one of the nervous systems designed by that program. I won't bother giving you the details. What's nice about it is you don't actually have to put it on the Keppra robot. You just put it on the computer and you have the robot's phony body. This is the phony body, the actual phony body of the robot, uh, which is actually just dangling down from above. It's the thing that moves around in the world. So you don't actually have wheels. You just think you have wheels. Or it just thinks it has wheels. So now they set the computer up, running 24 hours a day in the lab, just like Carl Sims. It does a new generation of robots. They start off random. They put them in this little toy world on a tabletop with a, with a, with a wall around it. And they're simply given their test. They're, 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 they are given three tests to see whether or not they can do better than random at finding the white triangle and, and shunning the white square. And after three tests, they are measured in the one, you're only as good as you are on your worst day, so they take the, the, the ones that do best on their worst trial. Those get to breed in the next generation. There's, yes, there's sexual reproduction, there's genetic crossover. Next generation is tested, and day and night, generation after generation after generation of these robots are tested, and after a few generations, as with Sims, they developed very high quality uh, seeking out the white triangles and shunning the white squares. Well, you say, all right, so what's new? What's different? So you do this, this trick in the real world. Well, one of the nice things about this was that, first of all, we have some wonderful illustrations of Leslie Orgel's second rule, which is that evolution is cleverer than you are. Harvey and Husbands didn't think that this thing would really work. So they thought they would jump start the process by hand designing some good nervous systems that would get up, up better than zero. And they back propagated the genomes for those and they salted the gene pool with some ringers, in other words, some hand designed robots, and put them in the pool. Evolution threw those designs out very quickly and replaced them with much better designs, also much more inscrutable designs. Very hard to reverse engineer these things. They're daft. They're really strange. You can finally figure out why they work, but Mother Nature is cleverer than you are. They're very subtle, uh, weird designs. But the, but the punchline, the one that I really like, is that one day, Harvey noticed that there was a strange bifurcation occurring in his robots. Some of them were behaving one way, and some of them were behaving another way, and he couldn't figure out why that was. Analysis of the data finally figured out what it was. Remember, this was running 24 hours a day in the lab. They were evolving a nocturnal and diurnal subspecies. The difference in ambient light in the lab was making enough of a difference so that the evolutionary process was selecting for it and sharply distinguishing them into two groups. That's the sort of benefit you get when you go concrete, when you get the physics, the real physics, and don't just simulate the physics. That's the reason why we do embodied evolutionary robotics rather than just virtual worlds. 
because that's the sort of effect that you would never put into the virtual world uh, uh, and get. Now, at the end of this, we still have an evolutionary algorithm. An evolutionary algorithm realized in concrete objects in the world and still of striking power at discerning remarkably small and unanticipated differences in the world and designing organisms to adapt to those differences. So I continue to maintain, as I did in my book, that here then is Darwin's dangerous idea. The algorithmic level is the level that best accounts for the speed of the antelope, the wing of the eagle, the shape of the orchid, the diversity of species, and all the other occasions for wonder in the world of nature. It is hard to believe that something as mindless and mechanical as an algorithm could produce such wonderful things. But it can. And I'm going to let Darwin have the last word. I would give absolutely nothing for the theory of natural selection if it required miraculous additions at any one stage of descent. If I were convinced that I required such additions to the theory of natural selection, I would reject it as rubbish. Thank you very much for your attention.